Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. There are many great enterprise grade type 1 hypervisors out there. KVM for Linux is extensively used in the enterprise and in data centers. Citrix Zen is very popular. There's VMware. VMware is the king of the mountain in terms of type 1 hypervisors, especially in enterprise. They just have fantastic products, but they're one of the most expensive products out there. Then Microsoft around 2008 when Vista was launched introduced its own type 1 hypervisor called Hyper-V. And we're going to use that type Type 1 hypervisor to explore the enterprise use of Type 1 hypervisor. So what is Hyper-V? Well, it's a virtualization platform that allows multiple isolated operating systems to share a common hardware platform. Now the word isolated is very important because guest operating systems are isolated. They don't know the hardware below it. They don't understand other guest operating systems that are running beside it. They don't have a clue. And this virtualization brings all kinds of awesome benefits. But over time, as vendors wanted to run more high performance servers in these isolated boxes, it began to cause real problems. So you'll see in this lecture, we're going to talk about many ways that they tried to figure out how can I get network out of this box and get faster performance? And then it's how do I get storage out of this box and get faster storage performance? All right, in the world of Hyper-V, we have to understand some terminology. And one of those terms is partition. A partition in Hyper-V is a logical unit of isolation and it's supported by the hypervisor. In Hyper-V, you must have at least one parent. Sometimes they call it a root partition, but inside must run Windows. That's unique to Microsoft's Type 1 hypervisor. Now a root partition, or a parent partition, then creates child partitions which hold the guest operating systems. Let's take a look at this diagram because this is how we're going to understand Hyper-V. If you notice, you got a layer at the bottom and that's your hypervisor that sits on top of hardware. It virtualizes a processor and memory and provides the virtualization stack to the root partition or parent partition. When understanding Hyper-V, you have to understand the root partition and the hypervisor combined make up the overall architecture of Hyper-V. The guests are important, but the root or parent and the hypervisor make a team to provide Hyper-V. Now the root partition has direct access to the physical I.O. devices. The virtualization stack in the root partition provides memory management for the virtual machines, management APIs, and a virtualized I.O. So here's an architectural diagram of VMware's ESXi. And you can see just from the block diagram that it's a very different approach to type 1 hypervisors. Back to Hyper-V, the root partition, sometimes called the parent partition, manages machine level functions such as device drivers, power management, device hot, addition, and removal. The root or parent partition is the only partition that has direct access to physical memory and devices. Now the parent partition hosts what is known as virtualization service provider or VSPs. These communicate over what is known as a VM bus. Now VM bus is a chunk of memory that is used to allow communication between the parent partition or root partition and the child partitions that you set up. So when a child partition wants to access IO, it communicates via 
the VM bus. Also, our Hyper-V management services run in the root partition. Looking at the child partition in the diagram, all access to physical memory and devices by a child partition is provided by the VM bus. You can see it in that diagram. You can also see the child partition here in the block called WinHV communicating hyper calls to the hypervisor. So this is my Windows 10 Hyper-V Manager. And you can see I've got Server 2022, Ubuntu, Windows 11. All of these guest operating systems are totally unaware of my ASUS motherboard that they're running on. But Hyper-V's job is to virtualize CPU, graphics, memory, all my I.O. devices up to these guest operating systems so that they think they're seeing hardware. The key with these virtualization tools is they present highly optimized versions of this hardware so that VM bus works very efficiently and these guest operating systems run with pretty good performance. So when I pull up the settings, my hardware settings for this Windows 11, every one of these pieces of hardware that my Windows 11 sees when it runs is deliberately designed to work efficiently in that VM bus so that we get the very best performance possible. Here we see a SCSI controller. Now we don't normally see SCSI controllers in Windows 10, but this particular controller is designed specifically for the VM bus. So our Hyper-V hardware that is presented to each guest is deliberately chosen to be optimized for that VM bus. We are also going to add very special drivers inside the guest, again, to take advantage of this optimized hardware so that we get the best performance out of our virtual machine. Now the hypervisor, which is the very bottom layer, controls and arbitrates access to the underlying hardware. That hypervisor is written in C++. The scheduler, that block you see that's called scheduler, is what is giving all the processes in the child, all the processes in the root, access to the CPU. That's written in assembly for speed. The hypervisor and virtualization stack is about 20 megabytes, 19.4 for the virtualization stack and about 600K for that hypervisor. Now, Microsoft also has special software called Integration Services that it adds to the guest. This special software and drivers, Microsoft calls this enlightened. In other words, the guest becomes enlightened. All that means is that it has better performance. You can run guest operating systems that are not enlightened or don't have this special software and drivers. They do have a performance hit. When you add this integration services into the guest, they get a lot of cool features. They allow the Hyper-V manager to more effectively shut down, time synchronization, good data exchange, a heartbeat monitoring of the guest operating system, backups, and guest services. So these integration services are available to Microsoft guest operating systems, but they're also available to many Linux FreeBSD operating systems also. And I've got a list here of the versions which also have access to this type of enlightened services and drivers. Now remember, in the root partition, you have to have an operating system. So if you're running Hyper-V on a client, you have to have either Windows 8, 8.1, 10, or 11 in the root partition. On servers, whatever version of server you have in the root partition, they want you to use server core when possible. Remember, server core has no GUI, but it does have a basic console. Configuration must be done with remote management tools or PowerShell. It is best in a server Hyper-V environment not to add any roles or feature except Hyper-V. No other software to get maximum performance and minimal attack surface. When you install server core in the root partition. This is what you get. You basically have a command prompt, PowerShell, and this little console, which allows you to kind of get the server going. And then you have to use remote tools to finish it up. Now here's something very important. Hyper-V comes two ways. It comes as a standalone, license-free, unlimited use version. It also comes with Windows Server, and then you add Hyper-V as a feature, like we do with Windows 10 and Windows 11. Windows Hyper-V standalone, you would think the free or license-free version would be features removed, things you couldn't do, but that's not true. You can actually provide an enterprise-ready private cloud foundation on the license-free standalone version of Hyper-V. So here I'm at the Microsoft download page, and you can see you can get Server 2022, and you can get 
get server 26, 2019, 2016. But you'll notice in between those full versions of, of Windows Server are Hyper-V Server 2019, Hyper-V Server 2016. Those are the Hyper-V standalones. No licensing free. You can use them. You can get them as far back as 2012 all the way up to 2019. Or you can get a full-blown server, pay the license, and you get Hyper-V as a feature that you install. I'm working on two server cores right now. One is a general purpose 2016 server core, and I'm painfully using Microsoft documentation and third-party documentation getting that configured. And eventually we'll get my remote access working. And this is my, my Hyper-V 2019 standalone. It's got Hyper-V feature built in. It's got server 2019 core involved and just getting it configured, setting up all my firewall settings, my remote access. I haven't tackled my, my Hyper-V switch, which I have to do. Just doing all this through PowerShell. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a Word document and I'm documenting every step that I'm taking and putting all my scripts and all my, when I have to switch to command line and I have to go back to PowerShell to get this done. And I will have that document and eventually I will post that in the video description for this video. So if you want to go back, I may not have it done when I post the video, but you want to go back and get that document because it will help you do any server core. Great documentation on the internet using Microsoft documentation. Hopefully by the end of this Hyper-V series, we'll come back and take a look at this and we'll see the results of a lot of hard work. Now, if you're thinking that Hyper-V for the desktop and for the laptop, well, that's for IT pros and IT students and maybe developers who want to run containers and Kubernetes and all that good stuff. You're absolutely wrong. Hyper-V is becoming a absolute must for laptops, desktops, tablets, etc. Microsoft is baking in some of the most critical security technologies based on Hyper-V. No, you don't have to run a virtual machine, but you do need to install Hyper-V. Without Hyper-V enabled, you can't run Windows Sandbox, which is amazing. If you haven't played with Windows Sandbox, you need to. They use immutable disks, and if you don't know what that is, look it up. It's cool. Now, they also put Windows Defender Application Guard, Windows Defender System Guard, Windows Defender Advanced Threat Detection. You can't today be without these kinds of security components. Obviously, you can use Hyper-V. You can run containers. You can also add Windows Subsystem for Linux, and if you're a developer and you want to use Kubernetes, you also also have to have Hyper-V installed. Now the basic Hyper-V requirements are 64-bit processor with SLAT, second level address translation. You need Intel's VT technology and AMD's V technology enabled in your BIOS. You can see I've got my HP server here. You can see I've got all of those in that box, all of those had to be turned on so that I could get the proper Hyper-V settings. DEP has to be enabled. This is the hardware enforced data execution protection. Now these are the basic requirements. If you start moving into other things like shielded VMs, you're going to have to have more features than just this, but this will get Hyper-V installed. Virtualization is a big deal for enterprise, for data centers and cloud providers. The problem was they wanted to move more and more servers into a VM environment. Many of these servers were hardware intensive, needed a lot of fast network, a lot of bandwidth intensive storage, and putting them into a VM, the hypervisor actually becomes the problem. The value of isolation through a hypervisor and a VM actually became a problem with performance. So there had to be a way of putting these servers in a virtual environment, but still getting the performance that they need. Players like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon knew that if they did not address this bottleneck, this VM performance issue with their network card, or storage, and eventually graphic cards. They were never going to convince enterprise customers to move from premise to cloud. They had to improve this. And it turns out all the devices that were slowing VMs down are sitting squarely in the PCI Express bus. Your network cards, your storage controllers, your HBA fiber channel, all of them are sitting in PCI Express. And of course, you've got this layer of hypervisor between them. So single root IO virtualization was born. This meant a lot of serious engineering. Chips had to be designed. Firmware had to be rewritten. CPUs had to support it. Drivers, devices, 
is had to be baked in with this technology. But now with single root IO virtualization, each VM can now see the PCI bus root as bare metal and it could be shared among VMs. So this is big, Hyper-V and single root IO virtualization. Giving those virtual machines direct access to the PCI Express root made all the difference. Take a look at the graphic on your left. This is a typical high performance server, one operating system, one application, everything directly talks to hardware. You're gonna get incredible performance out of this server if it has enough hardware resources. Come over here to your right, and now you can see we've got a virtual machine, the hypervisor, and you can immediately see that there's a lot more layers between the application and the virtual machine and that high performance storage controller or my high performance network card and that's going to impact performance. Take a look at this graphic. Now you can see where single root IO virtualization comes in, where now the virtualization can install a driver in the VM that talks directly to the driver of the actual physical device. We pull Hyper-V out of the way. No more layers to go through. We have direct access. Performance. So now single root IO virtualization is going to give GPUs, NVMe hard disks, storage controllers, HBA fiber channel, network cards, all the ability to directly access those PCI Express devices through a VM. Now you can look at this block diagram and I've got a network card that has single root IO virtualization enabled. And you can see my parent partition is accessing this network card. I've got two virtual machines that are accessing this network card. This is quite complex. It's not simple to do. I can imagine, I've never had to do this, but I can imagine troubleshooting these kind of issues is quite involved. But it does allow all of these virtual machines to better access, get better performance out of the network card. Here again is two block diagrams showing you normal Hyper-V with the way it is designed out of the box. And here when we add single root IO virtualization and you can see the difference. We're pulling out layers so that we get better performance. Another important issue in making better performance with these PCI devices is giving them access to main memory. MMUs are memory management units and we've been using them in general purpose computers to map physical memory to virtual memory. So we've always had MMUs. But with PCI devices that are bringing in massive amount of data to bypass the CPU and be able to access main memory is going to add performance. So now we're adding IO MMUs or input output memory units. When a device is DMA capable or direct access capable device, network card, storage controller, HBA, fiber channel, to move data quickly into main memory, they need IO MMU. Now AMD implements IO MMU in its AMD-VI. Now, Mr. V, you're killing us with acronyms. The reason I am making you very aware of these acronyms is that when you get into firmware, drivers, you better know these acronyms because this is what you're gonna be looking for to enable or disable. IO MMUs can be used to allow unmodified virtual machines to access IO devices. In most cases, when we're talking about SRIOV, we're always talking about IO MMU together. What is required to use this technology? You've got to have the CPUs that support virtualization, AMD-V, Intel's VT-D, latest server chipsets. You've got to have the upgraded motherboard firmware, operating systems, and hybrid supervisors that support this, PCI devices that bake in this technology, and drivers, many times drivers, have to be configured for this. So a lot involved. The device manager that you're seeing on your screen is inside a guest. So this is inside the operating system inside a VM. But look, we've got the driver for a specific server adapter. In the properties, we have to enable SRIOV. This is why you've got to know these acronyms because if you're going to enable this feature, you've got to be able to find this stuff. And in this case, this is a driver advanced property feature in the guest account that you've got to enable able to make this work. Here we see the hypervisor that has a feature that allows you to enable single root IO virtualization in the virtual switch. So this is going to be found in a lot of software and configuration. You're going to have to read your manuals, study your documentation. This is not going to be just one button click. We need an extremely fast pipe from the graphics card 
to the VMs, and even more than one virtual machine being able to share a video card. This is happening right now. NVIDIA has a product called Virtual GPU Software, and it enables multiple virtual machines to simultaneously access a single physical GPU. Microsoft Azure and other types of cloud providers are going to be able to offer PCs servers with high graphical throughput. NVIDIA's Quattro RTX 6000 is one of the video cards that they make available for this type of technology. They're only $4,000. This is their Quadro RTX 8000. Again, this is available for this type of technology. $5,500. Of course, they're not available. Here I've got a Dell BIOS, and you can see the SR IOV. You can enable it. And remember, single root IO virtualization allows multiple virtual machines to share a single physical interconnect. This is my HP server. All of these features in this dialog box must be turned on for virtualization. In that same server, you notice I'm in advanced options. You can see my SR IOV enabling or disabling. That's why those acronyms are so important. This is a graphic picture of a Dell server. And notice I'm in the settings of the actual network card, the Mellanox network card. You must enable SR-IOV or single root IO virtualization. Here's another Dell BIOS, server BIOS. And you can see again, if you don't do your homework as far as your manuals and read your the, the server firmware, you're not going to get everything on and it's not going to work. And terminology is not consistent among hardware vendors. So this could be quite challenging to set up properly for any admin. This is super micro server and I'm in the bias and you can see here you again you've got the feature and you've got to enable or disable it. Microsoft's cloud now needs even higher performance in its virtual machines and has now created a feature called Microsoft's discrete device assignment. So this new feature that was made available with server 2016 allows Windows to dismount PCI Express device from a parent partition and make it available to one of the VMs. So you first have to locate the device path and you can see an example there. Then you disable the device in the parent. Then you dismount the device in the parent and then you assign the device to a guest VM. You install the vendor's device drivers and voila that VM has bare metal access to that PCI device, whatever it is, typically a graphics card. Now when you're using Using DDA, the PCI Express device can only be used by one virtual machine. This allows it to directly access that within a virtual machine. So you could do GPUs such as Xbox Project X Cloud, NVMe disk, storage controllers, network adapters, whatever. This is an actual picture of the servers that make up Project X Cloud.